Hi, and welcome to Chitta Chats. We're going to follow up on a topic that came up in Chitta Chat number two. Uh, we were looking at the nature of I, which is really the topic on the table, the only topic ultimately, which gets us into the nature of the world and nature. When I say the essence of nature and the nature of essence, meaning let's really get to essence, which is that which is indispensable, that which our, our essential quality, essential nature is not a term we use lightly here. And so we looked at what we are not, saying that if I can observe the body, then therefore I am the observer. Body is an object in my perception. So that kind of raises the question, well then who is the observer? What is the I? And a lot of the method of the teaching is we teach through negation. We learn by process of elimination. And that raises various kind of quandaries and subsequent doubts and questions. For instance, something came up. So, if I were to be told I'm not the body, that may not sit very well, especially in um, the society we're living in. We focus so much on the body and there's so much information circulating about nutrition and exercise and, um, you know, this stuff used to not matter, maybe a little bit, but, you know, a hundred years ago people got up, they went to work, and they wanted to survive. Now it's all about surviving and looking good and feeling good and everything within your body. So we have this attachment to our bodies, and, I mean, where, where do you relate this? Well, and I think, too, um, also bringing it back to our shared experiences as practitioners of yoga, like, we include that practice in our practices. So if you could maybe bring that into the conversation. We include well. the practice of asana. asana. Right, so that's a good distinction to make, is this dialogue is yoga, <laughs> right? The term yoga, just because in our popular culture, when we say yoga, we equate it with the physical practice, this is an incorrect statement, right? Asana, the physical practice, is one subset in the eight limbs, the ashtanga of yoga, right? Ashtanga means eight branches. It's not a series of poses. Um, so yes, the point is, is the, the, what I hear you saying is the physical practice, the care of the body is intrinsic to the practice. Mm -hmm. And absolutely. So, and yet at the same time they're saying, don't overly identify. right? And again, not as a matter of belief or positive thinking, but look at it honestly. If I really inquire, I am this pigment, you know, I am... A, a brunette, I am blonde, and so forth. It kind of works if we have hair. You know, you can see, you can touch the color and say, I am brunette, there's a quality there to touch. But what if you say, I am bald? I think that's kind of tricky, because there's actually no hair there. The amness, I am the non-existent hair. You know? <laughs> we do all these things, and all the complexes arise out of that. So, uh, if we inquire, we, we come to see that the I is the one who is perceiving. And, and yet, it's not to dismiss the body. It's not a, a non-reality. And uh, the example I think we looked at one day too, this gets at key concepts in the, in the methodology, two key terms. And I'll use these terms, you know, introduce Sanskrit sparingly. It, it helps us in some cases to, to have a dialogue. Because we really don't have terms like this in the English language. Or if we do, they have so many multiple meanings that it's so hard to really get at, you know. So, mitya is that which is dependent upon something else for its ex existence. Meaning, this cup clearly exists. It's not non-existent. And uh, it's not illusion. However, if I keep <clears throat> the ceramic, and I say, you take the cup, You've got nothing. So the existence of cup is completely dependent on the, the fact of ceramic. The weight of the cup is the weight of ceramic. The color of the cup, the attributes of the cup are the color, attributes of ceramic, not the other way around. Does that make sense? So the cup, we say, is the world of name and form. Mitya, mitya that whose existence is dependent upon something else. Sat is the ceramic that whose existence is not dependent upon something else, right? So, of course, that raises the question, okay, if this body is mitya, 
it is real, it exists, but it's a dependent reality. It's not non-reality. It's not illusion. I don't ignore it and decide to, you know, let it go to bleep, right? <laughs> so the the uh, 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 the essence then that sucks, the the parallel example to ceramic then is what? What is this stuff of which I'm made of? And this raises a lot of ways to explore that. And and you know, kind of what I hear you saying was, well, how does this teaching help me? If I'm not this body, how do we move in the world? Mm-hmm. And one thing you both have responded, I think, very personally to is the teaching of the values that come up in the yoga, in the niyamas, in the 13th chapter of the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita. And, and do you, any comments you want to share on how those have touched you? Well, I guess if someone were to hear, um, I'm not the body, then they could take it in two different ways. Totally saying, you know, I am the body and I do want to treat it well, or I'm not the body, whatever, and I guess I can just, you know, let it go to waste. But ahimsa, non-harm, that is, if you let your body go to waste, that's doing your body harm. That is against um, our nature. And what were some of the other values that came up? Do you remember? So there's non-harming to others. Mm-hmm. Uh, it addressing seem like pride or pretense, jealousy. These are in the thirteenth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Aman etwam madam etwam him sakshanti rajavam. Kshanti is a forbearance, often translated as tolerance. So translation is an issue, right? How does it feel to tolerate something compared towards accommodating something? So kshanti is an accommodation. Which gets into, again, all these teachings relate to each other. The, the, if I'm accommodating something, it means particularly that which is beyond my control to change. Well, and I think that you brought up something really important um, in a discussion we had earlier about um, someone in meditation asking the question, how do I uh, accept that my body is is agitated during meditation or um, maybe just in everyday life experiencing anxiety how do you then turn that around and, and understand that with the, right with the teaching? well if we say I get anxious right this is where we if we inquire into that if I can observe the mind being anxious then the I is something else so the I in the Sanskrit text we call Atma sometimes purusha, that essence. And this will take some unfolding and unpacking over time. What are the qualities of atma? If we look at it, anxiety happens in the sphere of mind, body, senses. Right? And I have the ability to observe. Physical pain, as well as mental, emotional pain, can be an example as well. That the body will experience physical pain is a fact. Right? At some point, right? who has not felt uncomfortable in their body at some point, right? What about emotional pain? Em- emotional pain too, right? I want to write just physical pain because there's a, perhaps a little, the more ability to have a little emotional distance. It's a little easier to talk about at first, right? That if we accept that the physical pain is a fact, my sorrow is my thought about the pain. I experience blame, say I tripped and hurt my shin. Right? Something relatively benign. If it's not life-threatening, let's talk about that first. Because the life-threatening ones, it gets more and more challenging. But we talk about the ones that are smaller, less emotionally charged first, so we can understand the model, right? understand where we get to it. I bang my shin, not a threat to life. But if I'm having a lot of blame about you know, somebody who tripped me or something, through no intention, an accident, right? let's assume no ill will was... Even if there was ill will, <laughs> Well, I, that that is uh, an object, uh, a circumstance beyond my control, and this person developed as they developed for a reason, unknown or known to me. They had some rationale to do this. Why should I then lash out, right, or feel less than or threatened? So, physical pain is a fact. Illness is a fact. It's my thought about the pain that becomes the sorrow, and so same with an anxiety. You know, it, rather than saying, I am anxious, I observe the anxiety, I observe the fear. If I can do that, which we know we can, 
right? I am aware of the anxious mind. This is true, yes? Mm -hmm. And so, then who is the I? If there is that subject-object setup, who is the I? So the term Atma is naming that I. And through a process of further inquiry and, and, and questioning, what we arrive at is, is a lot of you in the yoga world may have heard the term Satchitananda. Sat is that, again, that whose existence is not dependent on anything else. Chitta is the consciousness in which all objects of the world become evident to me. My thoughts become evident to me. My emotions become evident to me. And chitta is that consciousness that is also self-aware. So it's a very unique that I is the only thing that needs no other object to be confirmed to you. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. That I am needs no external thing, thought, or, or else to, to validate that, to, to become evident to me, to confirm. That I exist is, is the only thing that is self-evident. And that's an attribute of chitta. Right? Ananda describes a fullness, a wholeness. In pop culture it's kind of translated as bliss. Which is a pointer, it kind of alludes to it. But bliss in itself is not the literal translation. The Sanskrit root has the term limitless, fullness. So the very nature of the whole, meaning nothing outside of, this is a radical thing for us to wrap our brains around. You know, you, you try to convey a circle, the visual on paper of a circle describing a whole, it doesn't work because there's stuff outside the circle. <laughs> Does this make sense? <laughs> and you say, well, the paper is the whole. Okay, but then the paper is on the floor of the table, right? So it, our, our world is, in, by definition, limited. And so getting at the concept of wholeness is at the heart of, of this method. The very essence of Atma is that wholeness. And why is that significant? Because then what we say is, the I, in fact, does nothing. The I is not the one feeling the anxiousness. And this is not to say we should become uh, detached or disassociate from caring for the body. We experience our aliveness through our senses, through this body, through you know, the, the world. And though we can say this body is mitya, is a dependent reality, it does not describe my totality. When the body is dead, if you've had a relative or a friend die, uh, my mother passed away, you look at the, the, the body, you recognize the body, but clearly mother is not here. Right? That essence is clearly, so we know there's, the body cannot be the sum total. What is it that lit up that body? This is what we're getting. Did it go away? A wave arises out of the water and then goes back into the water. Water is unchanged. Body comes and goes, Atma is unchanged. Saying it is not enough to internalize it. How do we get at this essential nature that is underlying? We see anxiety as an aberration. We know it to be the exception. We find it unacceptable to us. The term bliss is relevant because if we are happy and comfortable, we don't say, oh, I really want to change the situation. <laughs> right? We, when we experience comfort, safety, security, love, it touches our essential nature. We are more free to be generous, kind. If we're not threatened, those values come up more intrinsically. So hence, when you raise the himsa, the values, the niyamas, in that 13th chapter of the Gita, the, the teaching is then these values, these behaviors, aren't externally imposed. And Emerson talked about this too. The virtues get us closer to our essential nature, to our ground of being in his language. Right? So, and, and this sits well with us, in fact. Any of these teachings should jive with our gut. You know what I mean? If I said, oh, you are a limited, inadequate being, and let me teach you about that. <laughs> you know? You are far from whole and, and, and bound for suffering. You know, we like, wait a minute, that, that, uh, that doesn't sit right with me. I'm uncomfortable in those states. So there's something that we see. So, and then we go, well, what triggers that state of discomfort? 
if I let an external object, another person, uh, uh, a lack of a sense pleasure, uh, you know, the fact that I, I, I maybe, quote unquote, did not succeed in my work, you know, if I let those external circumstances define my sense of wholeness, I have a misunderstanding of my nature. And through these practices of looking at that success or failure, why should I feel less than? If somebody else is dissatisfied with me, why should I feel less than? Now, it's not to say we ignore other people. You know, these things can be taken sideways, and, you know, and, and, and we should then disregard other people's opinions. No, you can't navigate the world that way. Right? So, don't, don't mishear that. But does that make sense? Is this? Well, I think uh, the question that begs to be answered is, or um, that, how then do we understand the body in relationship to our everyday lives and to um, order and disorder, to likes and dislikes, to um, the nature of happiness, and. Um, and in relationship to one another. And to add on to that, um, you said observing that you're anxious, observing the anxiety, observing it. So once you become aware of the existence of that thought, then where do you go from there? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's rich, right? There's a lot there. Because we know that cognition alone will not resolve anxiety. Yeah. There's, Just there's... thinking, oh, I'm anxious. That Okay, then what? Well... Right. But at least I don't have to, we don't have to say I am anxious. Mm. Right? We can say this mind is anxious. Yes. But that said, there's neurochemical things happening. Brain chemistry has to be addressed through food, nutrition, sleep. Right? But not necessarily only treating it with a chemical drug. Our daily habits. And we know that our thoughts trigger a chemical reaction. So the practice of meditation and witnessing the thoughts can calm Raining our physiology. Raining in the thoughts. <laughs> Raining in the thoughts, that nirodaha, can calm our physiology. You know, so depending on how strong the imbalance, I see it as an imbalance, not as my nature. That would yeah. be an important step. For a lot of us, frankly, anxiety is a form of spiritual crisis. Often anxiety is a healthy response to an unhealthy situation. It's a sign, right? It's an invitation to, to look at it. What am I doing? How am I, you know, being hard on myself, so to speak, and, and, and looping into these things? Krishnamurti said, it's no sign of wisdom or good health to be well adapted to a sick society. Right? So again, it may be a, 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 a body, the mind is responding to a situation that the crisis is an opportunity for change. Not, I am this. I am this anxious person now. Right? It's a state that we recognize of imbalance, that we work with the physiology, the psychology, and, and all those things to bring in balance. But underlying that, when we have the understanding, Atma is untouched. Right? Whatever I do to the cup, the essence of ceramic is the same. Something happens, and we navigate with that equanimity. Yoga samatva uchate. Yoga samatva uchate, that sameness of heart mind an even keel, through success, failure, likes and dislikes, we see those things don't touch the nature of I. So can I navigate them pragmatically? Yeah. Good stuff.